Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. All right, welcome everybody to the Functional Medicine Discussion Group meeting tonight on why um, males and females have different immune systems and why it matters with Dr. Felice Gersh. I'm Dr. Ben White, and I'll start by making some introductory remarks. Then I'll introduce our sponsor for this evening, Integrative Therapeutics. And then I'll introduce our speaker, Dr. Gersh. I encourage each of you to participate and ask questions by typing your question into the chat box, and then I'll either call on you or I ask Dr. Gersh your question when it's appropriate. So thank you for joining our functional medicine discussion group monthly meeting, and I hope you consider some of our attending some of our future events. And um, uh, um, I look forward to meeting in person again once the Santa Monica Library goes back to their normal hours. I'm not sure when that will be. <laughs> and um, uh, so our future events, uh, November 17th, Julia Zaslow will be speaking about the business of functional medicine. So we'll go into a bit about marketing and how to run your practice. Um, there's going to be no meeting in December and then we'll start up again in January. Um, and if you are not aware, we have a closed Facebook page, the functional medicine discussion group of Santa Monica that you should join. So we can continue the conversation when this evening is over. Um, I'm recording this event. And I'll include it in my weekly Rational Wellness Podcast, which you can subscribe to on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. <clears throat> and if you listen to the Rational Wellness Podcast, please, please, please give me a five-star ratings and review on Apple Podcasts. So I'm pleased that the sponsor for this evening is Integrative Therapeutics, and Steve Schneider is going to tell us a bit about some of their products. Steve? Hello, everyone. Um, just tonight, just a couple little updates, uh, one not so little update. Um, as most of you probably know, Cortisol Manager is by far our biggest selling product. It's a, a formula to help people fall asleep when they're elevated cortisol at night. Um, the original product was uh, compressed tablets. In, in about two years ago, we released a newer version, an allergen-free version that was capsules but a lot of people um, stayed with the tablets. And um, there's a big update that if you're using those tablets or your patients are using those tablets, you're gonna hear about it. Um, we took the, the titanium dioxide out of the product. And basically all that was was a, a cosmetic to make the tablets white. Um, it kept the tablets looking uniform and so that they were from batch to batch, they looked the same. We've gotten to the point where we're consistent enough in our manufacturing that that's not an issue anymore. And a lot of people, I think just because of the name titanium dioxide, mostly uh, didn't like that ingredient. And so it's no longer in the product. Um, it's a big difference in looks. So if you have people taking that one, they're going to, they're going to say, Hey, this isn't the same thing I normally get. And you can tell them that they can be sure it's the same formula. Um, just a different color. So we think it's a good thing overall. We don't really have a position on titanium dioxide itself, but there's a perception out there. So we, we uh, reacted to market concerns. Um, the other one is just a really quick immune update. We have a product called V-Clear, used to be called ViraClear. It's a pelargonium extract that has been studied um, in over cl 20 clinical studies. It's, it's actually technically a homeopathic product, although it's really just an extract, but because it's labeled as a homeopathic product, we're able to make claims on it. And the claims we can make are that it, that it treats the common cold and flu. Um, there's about 20 studies on it over 9,000. My computer's always trying to get his friend Scott Vance. Oh, really? I guess he's in the habit. 
<laughs> um, over 9,000 subjects so far, 3,000 students. And, um, and the most recent one basically compared Be Clear to bacterial, um, upper bacterial infections, lung infections, and showed Be Clear to be more efficacious with less side effects. So it's, it's the real deal. Um, we can make it because we're a drug manufacturing facility, even though we don't make drugs. We have the GMP practices in place to make a product like this. Um, and as far as we know so far, we're the only drug GMP manufacturer of supplements. So it adds a lot of layers to the quality control and stuff. But anyway, remember V-Clear. It's, it's the real deal in upper respiratory infections. So. Thank you, Steve. Yep. Dr. Felice Gersh is a board certified OBGYN and she's fellowship trained in integrative medicine. Dr. Gersh is the director of the Integrative Medical Group of Irvine, and she specializes in hormonal management and care of patients for very for many chronic diseases. Her website is integrativemgi.com and she's available to see patients. Her phone number is 949-753-7475. Dr. Gersh lectures around the world. She's published three great books. Uh, her most recent book is Menopause, 50 Things You Need to Know. She also has a book on PCOS, PCOS SOS, and the PCOS Fertility Fast Track, her third book. She's also published a very influential paper in this prestigious journal Heart, which is part of the British Medical Journal family of journals on postmenopausal hormone therapy for cardiovascular health. And if Estradiol were a corporation and were to hire a lobbyist, it would most surely be Dr. Felice Gersh. Dr. Gersh, um, um, welcome to our meeting. Well, thank you. It's such a pleasure. It's been too long. And I'm so happy that even though we're not in person, that we have this opportunity to get together and I get to talk about some of my favorite topics, of course, involving estradiol. <laughs> and I am going to share my screen here. So my topic for tonight is all about immune regulation, the relationship to hormones, and what to do about it because hormones are so important and there are such differences between males and females. Now, notice I put flowers everywhere. <laughs> you, know, you know this is a girly talk, right? Because I uh, <laughs> definitely love flowers. Now, um, these flowers that I have pictures of here were taken by my youngest daughter because she loves taking pictures of flowers in her yard, in her garden. <laughs> she got a new house. And uh, flowers are very symbolic to me of all kinds of things, you know, beauty and happiness and love. And it's the reproductive organ of a plant, right? And a beautiful, healthy plant is going to have beautiful, healthy flowers. And of course, when you have an unhealthy plant, it's not going to create gorgeous flowers. If you've ever tried to um, grow plants with flowers, you know that, right? So everything about the female is about beautiful reproduction and flowers and health and vitality, which of course involve a healthy set of uh, hormones and immune function. I do work with a number of companies as an educator. Now, it's so important to know that in order to be healthy, you have to have what? You have to have optimal immune function, optimal metabolic function, and optimal hormonal status. Now, unfortunately for women, this is really problematic these days because of the ubiquitous endocrine disruptors or xenoestrogens that are everywhere that interrupt our normal hormone production, receptor function, de degradation, elimination. And of course, every woman, universal, unavoidable, maybe deferrable, but not for very long, has to deal with menopause, ovarian senescence, and loss of ovarian hormone production. Now, this creates a huge hit on immune function, metabolic function, because it's one body. It sinks and swims together as a whole because the prime directive of life 
is what? I knew this after I delivered just a few hundred babies and I've <laughs> delivered thousands. It is the creation of new life. Now, we humans are the only species on this planet that actually controls, hopefully we control it, when and if we have children. And I'm all for having timed kids when we want them or not having them if you don't want them. But we're the only animal that tries to say, oh, this isn't a good year. You you put a bunch of animals together, you know, uh, like a, a herd of deer, and they're not going to say, oh, this isn't a good year to mate it doesn't work that way right so they just do what comes naturally and so they have the creation of new life so it turns out that once you accept that the prime directive of life is in fact the creation of new life then you can see how everything in the female body is designed for successful reproduction and that involves fertility having a successful pregnancy then having the baby born, the, having the baby nursed, raising that child to its sexual maturity so it can carry on the process of new life creation and doing this as a human multiple times in order to make sure that the species can survive. And that requires a wonderfully healthy body and a hugely important and very dynamic immune system because pregnancy is an incredibly unique state of being when the immune system has to have very significant moderation and modulation and alterations in order to be successful and of course not have the immune system of the woman kill its little foreign creature growing in her, that little fetus. So in order for that to be successful for there to be a you know a baby that's born that's healthy and then the mom is healthy and then this happens over and over a female has to have an incredibly responsive and robust immune system compared to males because males don't go through this incredible process called pregnancy now whether a woman wants to have a baby or not her body is essentially designed for that purpose. And in order for that to happen, you need to have the what I call the mother hormone, the hormone of life, estradiol. Now, I often in my slides, I use estrogen to be synonymous with estradiol, just because that's the word that people use. But we're going to talk a little bit about estrogen, because there's so much misuse and misunderstanding about estrogen, estrogens. And the thing about women is that because they have this amazing, more responsive and robust immune system compared to males, when things go wrong, they go wrong in a bigger way. And we'll talk about the issue of autoimmune disease, now quite epidemic, as you probably know from your own practices, how many women are dealing with autoimmune disease and autoimmunity, right? Because we as functional medicine practitioners don't just care about end-stage disease. In fact, our goal is to prevent end-stage disease by recognizing the early incipient signs like autoimmunity, like positive ANAs, before the actual autoimmune disease is evolved. So estrogen, in order to maintain the immune system working properly, has receptor systems all through it. All aspects of the immune system are involved with estrogen. Now, I mentioned men and women are different. This comes up all the time in all my talks. And the gut microbiome, which is talked about in everything now, right, as the center of the universe, who knew, you know, a, you know 15 years ago that we have this little control center in our gut that has these trillions of microbes that's actually sort of like pulling the strings around our bodies. Well, men and women, as they have very different immune systems, you may say, but they have all the same cells. Well, they actually work in somewhat different ways. And we have actually different microbiomes in our gut. And this was found out when they did some fecal transplants, for example, and they gave male transplants of fecal material into females. And then the females started making a whole bunch of testosterone. And so it's really interesting. We are different in so many ways. And, you know, I, when I was back as a younger woman, I was 
growing up during the age of feminism, when the word even evolved, the word feminist. Did you ever hear that? So I was an early feminist and I thought men and women should be the same, you know, that we should wear those men's suits as a, a female. Well, that's not true. You know, we are really different and we can accomplish all the same things, but we are different. And we need to, if we're going to take care of women, we need to understand their physiologic differences from male so we can optimize care. Did you know that it wasn't until 2015, that's not that ancient that in history, right? That it was not required by the National Institute of Health that females be incorporated into studies, <laughs> you know? Okay. So we have actually kind of limited data on a lot of female topics because nobody was studying women. Why was that? Well, because we're more complicated because we have cycles. We could get pregnant. We could be on contraceptives, which, you know, are chemicals. And we could go through menopause and all these things complicate women as study subjects. So they just left us out. That was it. You know, so who knows about women? Well, we're trying. But I'm telling you, we need more data always. When people say to me, what about this? What about that? I say, hmm, well, I'll give you my best guess best based on the science, because guess what? We have actually no data. So. But we do have information, we do have science, and we do know, as I mentioned, that females and males have a lot of differences within how their immune systems work. So it's not just about how things look from the outside, it's how they work from the inside. So males and females, their differences are driven by their chromosomes. Now, I'm sure you know this, what's a guy, a male, from birth, right? We won't talk about what they choose to be later, just from birth, okay? So they were, say, an XY. So they've got this big X and this little bitty Y. But you guys out there don't think it's inferior. It's just different, right, that little Y. And we have females born with two big Xs, and we'll talk more about that. And of course, it's not just having chromosomes and genes, it's how they're expressed. And hormones are very big on that. Uh, our gut microbiomes, our circadian rhythms. And then of course, females are more limited in that they have a very defined time when they can be reproductively successful, whereas males potentially could create new babies at any stage of their lives. It turns out this isn't just a human kind of a situation because when you look at other animals, in fact, looking at insects and lizards and birds and other mammals, they also show immunological differences between the male and the female. Now, females, as I mentioned, have a more robust, more dynamic, we'll say more powerful immune system. And that allows greater survival in things like pandemics. And this became actually very evident early on in the, the COVID pandemic in New York, where, you know, things were really in disarray back at the time of you know March and April 2020. And looking at the mortality rate in New York City from COVID, males made up over 60% of the deaths versus females, 38%. That is why is that? You know, because males do not do as well because their immune systems are you know, a little bit weaker in terms of their ability to fight off infections and sepsis. In fact, going way back into 1998, ancient times, for, for many of you perhaps, when they looked at survival of males and females who suffered with sepsis, look at the difference in the survival rate. About three quarters of women survived versus only a little over 30% of males. Women just have a higher survival rate from pathogens because of their very robust immune systems. Dr. Gersh, do we know about the likelihood of having long COVID for women versus men? Um, it seems that women are more subjected to, more, more likely to have long COVID than males. Um, and that's because when women are um, challenged and they're having you know, metabolic problems and they develop these like we'll say long acting viruses, they like have chronic viruses, they end up having more autoimmune. A lot of the long COVID is felt to be possibly, I mean, we don't even totally know, but it may be an autoimmune driven thing. And women, which we're gonna talk about, make up 80% of all the autoimmune sufferers. And, and we know that 
you know, women are just more prone to having reactions. And we'll talk about, actually, I can talk about like, why does an infection even cause autoimmunity? In fact, let me just tell you why, okay? So why is it that chronic infections and the common ones are all the different herpes viruses, right? So there are a lot of chronic infections with herpes. And then of course, now we think that the SARS-CoV-2 can cause a chronic infection. There's chronic infections with various hepatitis viruses, right? Hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV um, is obviously sort of chronic and so can HPV. So when you have an infection, an acute infection, the body makes antibodies. Um, that's, you know, by the adaptive immune system. Well, I'm going to cover this, but I can jump ahead because, you know, why, what the, who says we have to go in any specific order here? So this is very important. Women have more B cells. Women actually make, women have more immune cells than men. Women make antibodies in greater quantity and more robustly and more readily. So every time you have an infection, the body will create antibodies. And that, of course, applies to vaccines as well. That's why every single vaccine has the potential to have an autoimmune reaction. This is 100 percent. Every single infection has the ability to create an autoimmune response. Why is that? Because you always make antibodies with every infection. And it turns out that we and viruses and bacteria come from the same primordial pool of nucleotides. You know, the, the building blocks of RNA and DNA are the same throughout every life form on planet Earth. They're just like rearranged differently, right? Like amino acids to create different proteins. And so these nucleotides, RNA, DNA are similars. So when you make antibodies against a virus or a bacteria, there is always what we call molecular mimicry. These antibodies will always attack our own cells, always 100%, but it should be in an acute situation, it's short-lived. So you make antibodies against whatever tissue in the body is most similar to that particular pathogen. And in fact, they even have charts showing different pathogens that are associated with different autoimmune diseases. Because if you have a chronic infection, and remember leaky gut is like a chronic infection because you're having influx into the body of pathogens from the gut. But you can have leaky other things too. Women can have leaky vaginas where they have any barrier between the outside world and the inner body can be leaky. So you can have leakiness in the sinuses, in the bronchial tree, but the gut is the biggest you know, potential source of this leakiness. And when you have an infection that is coming from, you know, not from the gut, say like with these other bacteria, like people can have chronic strep infections where they have in the crypts of their tonsils, they can have the strep just kind of hiding out there and that can create all kinds of problems. And of course, we know that um, strep infections before we had antibiotics, you know, the penicillins, they could sometimes give you things like scarlet fever, rheumatic heart disease, that's autoimmune based. And if any of you have read Little Women, you know, there was a little death in that family from a, a young girl who had the autoimmune response to a strep infection. And, you know, those are tragic things. And But autoimmune diseases are ongoing and we have so many you know, disruptors to our immune system, so many more chronic infections that we're having, you know, this autoimmune. And of course, the leaky gut is a big source of these chronic pathogens entering into the body. So we have this molecular mimicry issue where you make antibodies against the pathogen, but it cross reacts with ourselves. And women, because they make more antibodies than men, make them more readily and have more B cells that make and the antibodies and women have more of the, the dendritic cells. These are the ones that are the passers honors of the antigen. So they, they communicate with the other immune cells like neutrophils and mast cells and they then have their little arms that stick out and then they connect with the, um, the lymphocytes, the B lymphocytes that make the antibodies. So the females have a better, like we'll say, um, directional system of communicating the antigen being there 
to the cells that make the antibodies. So, um, and so this is gonna to apply to COVID as well. And so this is like a huge problem for long COVID is more female, just like autoimmune. And, you know, like, so women have the advantage in survival for acute infections, but for long-term chronic infections, it's a problem because autoimmune disease can definitely ensue. And over time, you know, there can be other things that sort of take over and almost like get a life of its own where, um, you know, the antibodies continue. And sometimes you can never find like what the original pathogen was that, you know, initiated this whole sequence of events. And we, if we go back here to like COVID and we, and we look, we can see that, um, that deaths and, um, and hospitalizations were also varied by gender as well. Um, so I mentioned the X chromosome is different. This is actually not a small matter because this is huge. Not see hormones are a big part, but it's never just one thing, right? Everything is always complex. So it turns out that that extra X chromosome that females have is very instrumental in creating this more robust immune system. So the estrogen sort of perpetuates it, but the X chromosomes actually initiate it. So when you are made as a female, you have two X chromosomes. Now it's believed that one of those X chromosomes is randomly silenced during um, the time of, of being an embryo. But what really happens is both X chromosomes are functioning for several weeks. And during that time before the one random one is sort of quieted down, they actually are changing how genes express themselves within the immune system. So during those first beginning weeks of life, both X chromosomes in a female are, are acting, they're functional, and it's changing how genes are being programmed to behave. And, you know, in terms of how immune system, immune cells will react. And then when that X chromosome is silenced, it's actually not completely silenced. It turns out that about 15% of the genes are not silenced. They keep functioning. And it turns out that most of those ongoing functioning genes of the extra X chromosome, they're actually related to immune function. So women are so programmed to have different immune systems from the earliest stage of embryological life. And of course, this is why it's so important to not have endocrine disruptors and chemicals and things on board right from the get-go because things are critically happening right from the beginning of life. And when things are not right and we have improperly programmed receptors and these systems that are coming on board, that makes women much more prone to diseases and cancers and so on. Like they've, they've now identified, for example, that early age, like little bitty kids, like two-year-olds and such who get um, like acute lymphocytic leukemia in these really early childhood years, that they were exposed in utero to things like high levels of pesticides. You know, it changes how the immune system is working in utero. That's why I'm so big on preconceptual planning and maintaining the cleanest possible environment and food intake and water intake during every stage of pregnancy, including the very, very beginning. So once you recognize that these genes that are involved in so many of the immunological functions are located on this, the X chromosome, then you can see how the, look at these different types of genes that are all X chromosomes. The, the pattern recognition genes, cytokine receptor genes, transcriptional factor genes, non-coding DNA regions, immune cells themselves. These are un, unbelievable. Even when you get rid of the hormones, okay, females are going to function differently than males. And even in an environment where you take away the sex hormones, the X chromosome, the double X chromosome females um, and this is in mice, because sometimes, remember, we don't have everything in humans, but, you know, we have a lot of data. They also had more of the mouse equivalent of lupus and MS. So it, genes are not insignificant. And when we look at the what where estradiol receptors are, it's everywhere and it affects 
the immune system in a whole host of ways. Now, um, you mentioned that I had a paper that was published in Heart last December. I had a paper that was on estradiol and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which is very related to survival and the immune system as well. And basically, the, the basic tenet of that is that estradiol, when you have the right balance of estradiol in the body, it actually operates the switch, the switch that turns on inflammation and turns off inflammation. That's why sometimes like it's very tricky that people say, well, it's pro-inflammatory. Well, it's anti-inflammatory. Well, guess what? It's all of the above because estradiol is a modulator regulator of the immune system. So when you have an immune system that's activated because of appropriately, it's because a pathogen of some kind is trying to get into the body or there's trauma. So, you know, the PAMS and the DAMS, right? So the immune cells are activated by pathogens and by damage. And so when this happens, it's estradiol into action. It activates the immune system. It actually turns on monocytes, neutrophils, mast cells, all of that to get going, to create the inflammatory response to save that woman's life. That's why women have higher survival in infections and sepsis. But you don't want unending inflammation. That's a killer, right? Chronic inflammation is the last thing anybody wants. Estradiol also turns off the switch from pro-inflammation into anti-inflammation and pro-healing. So this is like really important that estradiol modulates every aspect of the immune system, which includes every immune cell and the platelets. So platelets are very involved in immune function. And in the way that's involved with the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is that's a system for survival. So if you're infected or you're traumatized, you're bleeding, you want to activate the pro-inflammatory arm of the RAS system so that you have increased aldosterone. You have fluid retention to maintain volume in your vascular system so you don't go into shock. You want to actually create leakiness in arteries. You want leakiness because when you have immune cells circulating, if, they're, if they can't get out of the blood vessels, how are they going to get to the extracellular sites of infection. So you create a leakiness in the vascular system to allow platelets and to allow the immune cells to exit the conduit, the, the artery and the capillary so it can get out into the tissues. And then it activates the immune cells so that cells like macrophages, neutrophils, they put out all of their toxic products to destroy the invading pathogen. And it activates Estradiol activates phagocytosis so that you can actually gobble up and then get rid of dead damaged tissue, get rid of the pathogens. All of this is modulated by estradiol. And a lot of this is not as active, of course, in males, because look at here what I put in a little, I don't know what color that is, sort of orangey. I wrote testosterone suppresses immune cell activity. Sorry, guys, you have many other skill sets, but you're not as good at creating the pro-inflammatory state to you know, deal with trauma, to deal with sepsis, to deal with infection. And I'll tell you why in a minute, in case you're wondering, why is this? Well, you know why women have to have this dynamic um, immune system. It's so that it can mod be modulated during pregnancy, but also because Okay, I'm going to give it to you straight. If you had a pandemic and you had 10 men survive to every female, that's not going to get you where you need to go as a species. But if you have 10 women survive to every male, well, you can repopulate the planet, right? So nature wants survival of the species. So women have to raise the children. Women have to procreate and make new kids. So you need to have more women survive than men. If you have trauma, if you have infections, it's just the way it is. Who's better at surviving a famine? Who holds on to their fat more? Oh, it's us, right? So it's just what it is. But you guys, you are bigger, stronger. You have more muscle mass. And that's where a lot of your energy goes. Where else does your energy go? Making all those sperm 
Oh my gosh, it takes a lot of energy from the body to keep making sperm. It takes a lot of energy in the female to keep that immune system going. So it's a division of labor and energy. So there's only so much energy that you can create in the body. The female puts an enormous amount of her energy into maintaining that robust immune system with all those cells, those extra cells, all that extra activity. And males put it, their extra energy into maintaining a larger structure, more lean body mass, more volume, more mass, and the energy it takes to keep making all those sperm. So it's just how nature divided up. Everything in life is about successful reproduction and survival for that purpose. And then indirectly, uh, the hormones are going to be involved in microbiomes and circadian rhythms. And there's differences in every single part of the immune system between males and females. So women, as I mentioned, have higher numbers of cells that are immune cells. Women have higher white counts. Women have more immune cells and they are more active. So you can see, I mean, we can go through everything. Women have more of this, they have more of that. And, um, you know, so any, by the way, you know, anyone can have, you know, my slides, I share everything. And it, estradiol is so important that half of all the activated genes in the T cells are have estrogen response elements. Estrogen is involved in immune function. Now, men do have a lot of activity involving their immune system through estradiol as well, because you know all estradiol is derived from what? 100%, no exceptions. Testosterone, the precursor of estradiol is testosterone, is converted by the enzyme aromatase. And many, many tissues have the enzyme aromatase in them many, including arteries, including the heart, including the brain, including the skin, including the gut. And that enzyme helps convert testosterone for the male into estradiol so that it can have a lot of, a lot of the benefits and functions of tes testosterone don't come directly from testosterone receptors, but rather from its conversion into estradiol. So men have plenty of estradiol, but it's not circulating. It better not be, okay? So they shouldn't have high circulating. It's locally produced paracrine production and stays in those tissues. So, I mean, I just put a lot of things here, but it's really repetitious because I already told you women have more B cells. Women have more cells, T helper cells. They have more T helper one. They have more T helper two. They make more antibodies. They have more immunoglobulins. It's they, we just have more of everything that has to do with immune function. And as I mentioned, it's all about ultimate survival. Women have a bigger response to vaccines. And this drives me crazy. We don't make sex specific vaccines. You know, this is wrong because women have a greater reaction to them than men do. Um, so they're going to get more antibodies produced. So, I mean, they're more effective in women. So that's a good thing. But if they get a more, if they get an autoimmune response, then it's going to be greater. So women are more likely to develop, for example, Guillain-Barre or Bell's palsy from a vaccine than a male because we have a bigger response, but they don't down dose the vaccine for women because nobody cares. But, you know, we care. It's like doesn't seem right. And so I mentioned I call estrogen. This is I named this. There's no book that says this. This is me. I said it's the mother hormone. It's the hormone of life itself. It's the master of all metabolic functions, metabolic homeostasis and immune function. And what is metabolic anyway? It's the creation, distribution, utilization, storage of energy. So estrogen, and I say estrogen, but you know, I'm talking estradiol, the ovarian produced estrogen. It's involved in everything that has to do with energy. Now, why does energy matter? Because energy is the driver of everything, right? You need to have energy, it's life itself. And in order to have proper energy, you need to have a regulation in the brain that says, eat more, eat less. That's regulated. Actually, the nutrient sensors in the brain 
all have estrogen receptors. And that's a problem when you have a body full of endocrine disruptors, you know, these diabesogens, or you don't have enough hormones, um, or if you're on chemicals, you know, like hormonal contraceptives, where it can dysregulate your appetite. So your energy needs become mismatched to your energy consumption. This is a highly regulated system through estrogen, because it's so important for humans and every animal species to have the right amount of intake of food, AKA energy to match the energy needs of the body. You don't want under, and you certainly don't want over. But the default is when things are not right, it's over, you know, as you well know from all of your patient population. So, you know, just what is this hormone thing? A hormone is an information delivery system. It gets to the cell, it binds to receptors. They could be in the nucleus, they could be on the cell membrane, and information is delivered. And it's like having um, a Pony Express, and then when they when the finally you know the messenger gets there and he says, "Oh, I forgot to bring the message," you know, then it, like, what do we do? We don't have the message. That's like, what does the cell do if it doesn't get the message? Or worse yet, you have endocrine disruptors, it gets the wrong message. Well, that cell is not going to behave properly. And that's another competing problem for why you know we have such dysregulation of our immune system. And I know when I was back in training back in the day in residency, I didn't learn anything useful about hormones other than they had something to do with reproduction. But it's really about survival and life itself, because we now know that many creatures have estrogen receptors that do not have reproduction that's anything like humans. For example, animals that predated clams, you know, they actually have estrogen receptors. In fact, it's believed that the first steroid receptor that existed in any life form was actually estrogen receptors. So it's that's why it's the preeminent hormone of life. And one, and here I, I put down that invertebrates had um, no sexual reproduction like we have, and yet they had ancestral estrogen receptors. And this is really amazing when you think about it, that estrogen, which we think in our current medical system as all about reproduction, really had its first entry into life forms as a metabolic regulator. And of course, you can't have successful reproduction without optimal metabolism. That's like an essential. And we know that um, estrogen, and I talk, you know, estradiol, it does a million things in the body. You know, I go on and on, you know, it's like, you already know I'm the lobbyist for estrogen, as was said, right? It's <laughs> like uh, somebody's got to stand up for the underdog here, you know? Estradiol regulates everything, you name it, because it's about maintaining life. And there are these um, receptors. We now know alpha, beta. Now, now, in your last slide, you had estrogen increases lean body mass. Isn't that what testosterone does? Well, testosterone does that too. That's right. In fact, um, one of the biggest problems in menopause is actually sarcopenia. Estradiol is very big on maintaining lean body mass and muscle mass. That's correct. Um, estradiol doesn't get its place in the sun. Like uh, people don't, I have a whole lectures, maybe another day I'll, I'll come back about how sex, sexual function, sex drive and everything relies on estradiol and the relationship to peptides and, you know, um, vasoactive intestinal peptide and oxytocin. Yep. It's all, it, you know, and a lot of the male stuff, it does rely on conversion into estradiol. So yes, absolutely. And one of the big problems after menopause is loss of lean body mass and the production of really toxic inflammatory adipose tissue, especially in the belly and, and then, you know, visceral fat is so horrible. So Oh my goodness. I am going to write a book. I have to get to it on, you know, like the wonders of estrogen, but I don't know who'll buy that book, but you know, I'll just, you know, give out copies because I want people to know how wonderful this hormone is that has been so, you know, maligned so terribly. And this is like a little piece of important information that I always want to share. The estrogen receptors 
which are more predominant in different organs, like the alpha receptor is heavily in the hypothalamus and regulates a lot of the metabolic processes like appetite regulation, reproduction, uh, you know, like the menstrual cycle and so on. The circadian rhythm, the master clock is in the hypothalamus, which is um, heavily modulated by estradiol. Um, that, you know, in the gut, like the intestinal tract is predominantly beta, the cerebral um, cortex, is predominantly beta, our, you know, arteries are predominantly alpha. That's why you don't want one or the other. You want the balance of both. And when you have that, and these receptors are up and down regulating each other. They're, nothing is as simple as you may ever think. I, the more you learn, the more complex things become. And these receptors interact with one another. And high beta, like estriol, estriol works on the beta receptor estrone on the alpha estradiol is balanced and high stimulation of the beta receptor actually down regulates the alpha receptor and this is very key in pregnancy when you have lots of estriol because estriol is beta and it down regulates alpha and where is alpha it's on the innate immune cells the innate immune cells um, but it's also on the arteries that's why pregnancy is the ultimate stress test for women, because you have vascular challenges, you have changes in gut microbiome, which I'll talk about. You have instantly dysbiotic gut microbiome very shortly, not instantly, but shortly after pregnancy occurs and it progresses. And that's designed to do what? to create a small degree of insulin resistance. Inflammation causes insulin resistance. And so every woman who's pregnant is sort of on the the fringe on the on on thin ice between having just a little bit of insulin resistance and crossing the line into gestational diabetes. If you ever wonder, like, why do women who are pregnant get these diseases, like gestational hypertension, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia? It's because they become pro-inflammatory, but for a purpose to increase insulin resistance, but just enough to increase fat storage and production in the pregnant woman because women have to store a bunch of fat. That's why women who are pregnant gain weight even if they don't eat more because they are insulin resistant and insulin drives fat storage and production. That also creates more blood sugar enough to cross into the placenta through into the baby to help grow that baby. Remember, humans evolved during times of food deficiency. You know, we didn't have like food on every corner, you know, so we had to be very capable of putting on fat and of growing that baby. And that's why women who are pregnant become insulin resistant and their immune systems are altered because alpha is on the innate immune cells and you want to downregulate them so that they are the attack animals. So they don't go and attack and put out their inflammatory cytokines to kill the baby. That's why women who are pregnant will often go into remission for many autoimmune diseases because they produce fewer inflammatory cytokines. They also are less capable of fending off pathogens like COVID, the flu, chicken pox and such because their innate immune cells are not going to be as functional. This is all part of the strategy of surviving during pregnancy for you know for the baby to survive so the mom's immune system doesn't kill off the baby. But we do not want to take a postmenopausal woman and try to recreate the scenario of a pregnancy because estrogen receptor alpha down beta the beta receptor when it's highly bound, you know, it will actually downregulate alpha and you need alpha. You're not trying to get rid of alpha. The only time you'd want to get rid of alpha is if you're treating someone specifically with breast cancer, because breast cancer positive um, is always when it has receptor positive for estrogen breast cancer, it's the alpha receptor. Okay. But that doesn't mean that you don't need alpha. Okay. So you want everything balanced. That's why for postmenopausal women, please give estradiol, not estriol, because we don't want to alter the immune status of women who are postmenopausal, so their innate immune cells are less functional. We're not trying to do that. We, this is a pregnancy is a very unique state. So don't try to replicate it because you're not, and it's not going to be beneficial. Don't try to recreate 
human females in a way that they never exist on this planet. So understanding this dynamic between the receptors it's, and, and how this changes how the immune system is working. So we'll show you some other things here. I already went over a lot of this stuff, the, the different forms of estrogen and how they react differently with different receptors and that there are estrogen receptors throughout the entire human body, as I mentioned, and on, on every single immune cell. And like, so just getting to basics, like why do we even have an immune system? Well, it's just amazing. I mean, the more, I mean, I didn't learn enough about the immune system back in the day when I was like in medical school, I can tell you, I, I didn't realize all the things that it does, but it's a tremendous information system, the, the inflammatory cytokines, and there are anti-inflammatory cytokines as well. They're also like communication systems that really tell different cells what to do. So it's amazing what the immune system does. And uh, we need to do everything we can to maintain it. In this looking like busy looking slide, it's just looking at some of the different peptides and enzymes that are all modulated by estrogen, estradiol. And I highlighted in yellow, a lot of the ones that are specific for the immune system, but basically everything interacts with the immune system, but it involves all the issues with lipid metabolism, coagulation. So remember estradiol does not cause blood clotting. When you have a regulated immune system, it causes blood clotting when you need blood clotting. Like when, like if you have hemorrhaging, okay? Or as well, platelets are activated if you have an infection. Like why would platelets be activated if you have an infection? Because platelets help to create the encapsulation of infection. If you wonder how the heck do you make an encapsulation of an abscess? How does that happen in the body? That's through the action of platelets. And so they're, they're activated in infections as well. But you know, if you have a really severe chronic infection, this has happened with COVID, right? That you can end up having, you know, uncontrolled inflammation, and then you can have abnormal blood clotting that of course can kill people. So it's a fine line, just like pregnancy is a fine line. So too is, is navigating an infection so that you can control the pro-inflammation and the anti-inflammation. And in order for that to happen properly, you need to have the right amount of hormones and elderly people don't. That's why who tends to die the most from COVID? The elderly people, by the way, right at the beginning of COVID, I said, we need to do a study with estrogen to see if estrogen is going in like menopausal women uh, who are on estrogen, they're going to have better survival. But like, I couldn't get any of my friends who actually do studies because I'm a clinician. I couldn't get anyone to be interested in it. Well, there were some studies and there were some published data that um, yes, indeed, estradiol helps to prevent COVID deaths because duh, it modulates the immune system. And of course, pregnant women, now papers have come out that there's been a significant excess female maternal mortality related to COVID because pregnant women are not as able because of their innate immune cells being downregulated by estriol. And we don't want to do that to our postmenopausal women. Okay. So, you know, understand that in the end, estradiol modulates all of these systems. I put so up a, essentially you're saying no bias cream recommend. I am. I am saying that I'm begging you to stop using that. And then if you are using it, then say, why, where did you get this data? What is it based on? Somebody who said something 35 years ago who didn't even know, not through any fault of his own. So there's no decreased breast cancer risk? No. Where's the data on that? If you're treating breast cancer, they're, you know, like, like why do they give tamoxifen? Okay. Tamoxifen is like a chemical version to some degree of estriol. So I'm not saying also there is some published data that estriol can help modulate the immune system. It's like, think of it as an immune modulator. So it will downregulate the production of inflammatory cytokines, just like, you know, Remicade and Humira and all these, you know, drugs that are now so prevalent all over the place that are blocking, you know, this one blocks tumor necrosis factor alpha, this one blocks interferon, this blocks some interleukin and so on. Well, guess what? You know, estriol kind of decreases the production of all of them. So there's some data that it can help with 
MS. So I'm not saying there can't be potentially. Now, of course, we have pharmaceuticals that are doing all these things. So they never used a natural product because no money in that. Right. But, you know, understanding the mechanisms. Yes, there may be some benefit if you have breast cancer. There may be some benefit if you have like MS, but to give it to just the typical average woman who's in menopause, what the heck are you doing? You're not treating breast cancer. And by the way, estradiol helps prevent breast cancer. That you know even came out in that stupid Women's Health Initiative study. So how does this happen? Let me just step back a minute because breast cancer always comes up. When you don't have enough estradiol, who gets the most breast cancer? Postmenopausal women postmenopausal, not premenopausal, when you have enough estradiol, you're modulating the immune system. So you're preventing runaway inflammation. Okay. You're maintaining a healthy gut microbiome. You're controlling your immune cells, right? It's the controller. You're controlling all this. When you don't have enough estradiol, you end up in this pro-inflammatory state. You have gut dysbiosis, you have leaky gut, and you end up in this default system where the anti-inflammatory pathways can't be activated. It turns out that the anti-inflammatory pathways are probably more beta-driven and the pro-inflammatory more alpha. Well, after menopause, what do you make if you're a female? You make estrone. Now, estrone is made through the conversion of androgens predominantly coming from the adrenal gland, which makes huge amounts. That's where the, like the biggest steroid hormone is what? It's DHEAS. So that can be converted into estrone. Now, when you have chronic inflammation, you know, and postmenopausal women like inflammation, they become low grade chronic inflammatory people. And inflammation upregulates the enzyme aromatase. So now you're converting these androgens to estrone. Inflammation blocks to a significant degree, the enzyme that converts estrone to estradiol, because it should be back and forth. But the enzyme to convert estrone to estradiol is now largely blocked. So you end up stuck with estrone, the alpha receptor agonist. Now, when you have that, you're ending up feeding the inflammatory state, you're activating the innate immune cells even more, and when you have chronic inflammation, it's everywhere in the body, including in the breast tissue. Then chronic inflammation drives DNA instability and breakage. You get cancer. Now, estradiol and estrone, they're all growth hormones. Now they promote growth. Now growth is evil if it's uncontrolled, but it's essential for life because growth isn't about just getting bigger like the uterine lining gets bigger. Growth is about repair, rejuvenation. Like that's why everyone loves stem cells. And you know, you can't replace old dead cells, senescent cells, regenerate, heal wounds or anything if you don't have estradiol. So it's like the growth hormone of rejuvenation, okay? That's why like you can put it on your skin and guess what, wrinkles go away. I'm not kidding, there's data on that, okay? So the thing is, you don't want uncontrolled growth because uncontrolled growth can grow cancer cells that have those estrogen receptors. I told you breast cancer is alpha receptor positive. So now you have the perfect scenario. You have chronic inflection, in, in, inflammation that's driving DNA instability and breakage. And then you have breast cells exposed to estrone. Now estrone is made wherever there's adipose tissue in an inflamed person. Now, where is breast tissue? Um, what is breast tissue composed of in, in postmenopausal women? Largely fat. So estrone is made in the breast. So when you talk about where's the estrogen coming from, it's coming it from in the breast tissue itself. And so that's driving the growth of that breast cancer, which is estrogen receptor positive for alpha receptor. But if you had estradiol present in the first place, then you modulate the immune system to keep that inflammation, to keep the gut microbiome healthy and proper so that you don't become elderly in the sense that you have this inflammation process. So by starting your women patients on bioidentical estradiol and progesterone in a 
physiologic way, you can help to maintain them in a premenopausal health status to a large degree. It's not like getting 25 year old ovaries, but it's sure better than the opposite. And estriol is not designed for that, okay? And remember, estriol is beta. So it's not on the arteries, it's not the same. Please stop trying to create some new dynamic that doesn't exist. So just give the body what it does best on during the reproductive years, and that's estradiol. And you will make estriol, by the way, from estradiol when it's needed in the right amounts. So please, please, please think about why are you giving biased and who told you to do that, okay? <laughs> Okay, I'm evidence driven. There's no good data on that. It's only negative when you understand the science. And when you look at what estradiol does, look, it helps prevent people dying from influenza and um, more. You know, these are just articles that have been published. Here's, um, you can read this like the, the content. It's so interesting. Estrogen receptors regulate innate immune cells and signaling pathways. I mean, the takeaway from tonight is. Estradiol is wonderful, and you can't have a functional immune system if you don't have it. Okay, got it, everybody. And 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 look at the different pathways. It's like so seventeen beta estradiol. That's what's made in the ovary. Upregulates the um, I call it nerf two. I don't know what you say, but you know this is like like not optional. You know this is like so important. Everybody wants to increase nerf too, right? Well, estradiol does it. Estradiol does everything that you think you want to do. Where do you think you get NAD to activate? Okay. That's a coenzyme with the sirtuins. Guess what? Estradiol promotes NAD function. What else? How about the sirtuins that you want from fasting? There's a bi-directional effect between estradiol and the sirtuins. So all of you like anti-aging, you know, fanatics, you can't have any of these coenzymes and enzymes work properly in an absence of estradiol, okay? And like, look, I mean, I've, you know, I can like, I look for articles everywhere. So everything is science evidence based. You want to control inflammation, you get estradiol on board. And look at all what estradiol is regulating through the innate and adaptive immune cells. You know, I mean, the, the, all the neutrophils, all of these cytokines, everything is regulated by estradiol, Th1, Th2, the Tregs. If you don't have enough estradiol, guess what happens? You don't have proper functioning of your T regulatory cells, which help, you know, to control things in, in the body. Um, so definitely need that. So I think you know why we have inflammation. Well, inflammation needs to be tightly regulated by the toll-like receptors, which are circadian. And of course, estradiol helps regulate the circadian clock, uh, as I mentioned. Now, I have a whole bunch of slides here that um, just to, uh, oh, and I mentioned that estradiol is essential for phagocytosis. And what's a cousin of phagocytosis? Autophagy. Okay, estradiol, you always want autophagy, right? You never want continuous autophagy, but you want autophagy so that you can have cellular renewal. I call it, you know, like house cleaning, right? You you know, get rid of the junk and you turn it into fresh. Well, you need estradiol for that. And if you don't believe me, go on PubMed. There's a ton of articles on that. Now I put this here to show you, this is actually a mast cell. And look what's smack in the, in the middle there, ER alpha. Oh, estrogen receptor alpha. I told you it's on all the innate immune cells. And there's the toll-like receptors, and it's being activated in this case by the damage. You know, this is actually endometriosis that they're talking about here. But, you know, this could be a mast cell with any kind of injury. And then it degranulates and releases all of its toxic products in order to deal with um, an invading you know, pathogen or or damaged tissue and trauma. And then the, the, um, the mast cell then calls in the troops through its chemokines and activates all the other immune cells. And um, it's if you don't have proper estrogen receptor alpha function, oh, remember, estriol doesn't work on it and actually down-regulates it. You're not going to have proper immune response. Now, this is just showing, this is a mast cell, all the millions of things that mast cells do. It's like, and you see how it links to pain? Who has more pain, men or women? Women, women experience greater pain. Who frequents cannabis dispensaries? If you went to their cannabis dispensary, 
it's two groups of people in general young males looking for recreational cannabis and postmenopausal women looking for something to help them to deal with pain and insomnia you know and menopausal symptoms and such because women are more sensitive and mood problems to all of these things. A lot of these things are actually driven through the inflammation that becomes uncontrolled after menopause. So menopausal women are frequently visiting the cannabis dispensaries and they need you to guide them so that they don't feel they're on their own. Nobody cares about them. And then I just go through all the different immune cells. So you can look at this later, how estrogen works through all of these different immune cells. And you need to know at some point, I think, you know, what these different immune cells do. It's really fascinating. So I just put down like a lot of the things that like neutrophils do and macrophages. And of course, what are specialized macrophages? The microglia in the brain are specialized my macrophages. Microglia in the gut are specialized macrophages osteoclasts in bone are specialized macrophages. And after menopause, they all go kind of wild without control. They're like weapons of mass destruction without control, damaging the brain, damaging the gut, and of course, causing more osteoporosis. That's why the best thing for bone is what? Estradiol. I do whole lectures on bone health. And of course, everyone out there who deals with the musculoskeletal system needs to appreciate that because, you know, women have 80% of osteoporotic fractures. This is preventable. Over 50% of women have osteoporotic fractures and bone is amazing tissue. It not only is structural, but it also is an endocrine organ as well. So the dendritic cells I've mentioned, they are the messengers between the innate and adaptive immune systems. Women have more of them and are better able to transmit the information to the adaptive immune cells, you know, the, the um, lymphocytes that make the antibodies. And um, all of the T cells are upregulated and functional with estradiol, the T lymphocytes of all the B ones. And so what you, all of these things you have to think about when you're giving chemical endocrine disruptors like oral contraceptives. I mean, this is really important when you understand the importance of how hormones work in the female body. What the heck are we doing when we give chemicals that prevent ovarian function during the reproductive years? I don't think this should be ignored. We know, for example, that young women, because we don't have data on women over 20, but girls in their teens who start on birth control pills have higher lifetime risk of cardiovascular events. They never reach optimal potential for bone density and muscle growth. So these are big deals. And then think about all the endocrine disruptors. And then once again, think about what hormones do you want to give women in menopause? Um, the lymphocytes, of course, you know, and they're so all involved with the, the function of the immune system and regulated by estradiol. It's important to know this is uh, estradiol is essential for proper phagocytosis. I mean, most people don't know that. So antibodies lock onto the antigen, but they don't kill it. Antibodies alone do not kill. It's the phagocytosis that actually does the killing. It's the one-two punch. And all of that involves estradiol for optimal function. So an estradiol, its effects are variable depending on levels. That's why the whole concept that came out after the Women's Health Initiative of give the lowest dose, that's insane. What you want to do is give the most physiologic, effective, you know, efficacious dose because women who have very low estrogen are more pro-inflammatory. What's a pro-inflammatory state of a woman in a natural cycle? It's when she's having her period. That's when estradiol is the lowest of the menstrual cycle. And why is that? Because having a period is actually a pro-inflammatory state because your body is contracting the uterus, getting rid of the lining, and it produces pro-inflammatory prostaglandins. And of course, when you don't have proper regulation, you end up with what? Heavy periods and terrible cramps. That's a red flag that this person is not properly regulated. They have too much inflammation. They may be stressed. They may have nutrient deficiencies, hormonal imbalances, endocrine disruptors. So remember, the menstrual cycle is a vital sign of female health status. 
So when you have a messed up menstrual period, it means that if something wrong with the owner of that menstrual period, the solution isn't to give her chemical endocrine disruptors. The so solution, that's smoke and mirrors. The solution is find out what's wrong and fix it, like we always do in functional medicine, right? Right. And um, so, you know, um, also it affects TH1, TH2. Like who has more allergies? Oh, women. Okay. Did you know that? And that's TH2 driven. In pregnancy, progesterone pushes towards TH2. Okay. And down regulates TH1 because you don't want to have so much cell mediated immunity. You go more to humoral immunity. And, you know, I would love to give a whole course on, you know, immune system if, you know, if you don't know what I'm talking about, but um, these are things that you should look up if you don't, you know, because, you know, this is really important to understand. I think foundational to understanding how to treat anyone is understanding the, the basics of the immune system. And I mentioned progesterone is actually innately anti-inflammatory because remember during pre everything's about survival and pregnancy is about you know reproduction and survival of the fetus and the mother so you don't want to have the immune system killing that fetus progesterone is innately anti-inflammatory and that's really important because some people don't give progesterone to women who don't have a uterus if they're going in, in menopause this is so important it has all the functions of down regulating you know, um, muscle. So that's why women in pregnancy are often um, more constipated. They have more laxity. I'm sure, you know, dealing with people in their joints, right? That pregnant women are more likely to have more laxity in their joints because everything is like a little bit looser. And so everything, when you think about it, it's all about survival. And just to let you know how important estradiol is in modulating the immune system and inflammation, here is looking at ERR. Alpha. ERR stands for estrogen related receptor. Estrogen works not only directly, estradiol, on its receptors, but also through other ligands that are binding to receptors. We don't even know what those ligands are that are binding, but they don't work properly in an absence of estradiol. And see how it helps to regulate or modulate and block NF kappa B, and it helps improve mitochondrial function and biogenesis. This is all through secondary actions of estradiol. And I mentioned about autoimmune disease, but now I think you already know because women have more robust immune systems. They are going to make more antibodies more robustly. They deliver the information to their immune cells more aggressively. And it's just a big problem for women now. And um, we know that I've already talked about sepsis um, is definitely works better. So here, when you took out the ovaries in, in rats and then you didn't give them estrogen, they died. If you gave them estrogen, they didn't die. <laughs> That's pretty good. And uh, in terms of um, the microbiome, estradiol is very key to regulating the microbiome. Women in menopause have an altered gut microbiome. It's dysbiotic. Women in pregnancy have an altered gut microbiome, but that's intentional to create a low-level controlled fire, low-level inflammation and low-level leaky gut. But so many women now, pregnancy-related complications are through the roof horrible through the roof. So it's important to understand that this is every woman going through pregnancy needs to be optimally healthy first, because this is such a stress test for women. So I'm not going to, I know, you know, we don't want to be here forever, but uh, you know, if I'm let alone, I probably will keep you here. So I'm going to, um, can I just to... ask, ask a question, uh, oh, speaking sure. for men, um, who don't have a lot of estrogen, but what they make sorts... it. remember they make it. Yes, I, I know we have some estrogen, but um, are there strategies that can allow men to get some of the benefits that women get from this estrogen? Absolutely, because once you know that men like, OK, so it's changing a bit now because of all the endocrine disruptors. But traditionally, men had much higher rates of non-reproductive cancers, like like way back in the day when I was being taught in medical school, men were the ones who had most lung cancer, bladder cancer, um, pancreatic cancer. Like I said, it's not the same as it used to be because of all the endocrine disruptors that are present. But men 
do have more deaths from immune related issues. So what they have to do is maintain a high intake of antioxidants and polyphenols, you know, to help to, to, to deal with that and take targeted supplements. So a new article just came out, shocker alert, that low vitamin D is associated with increased mortality. I mean, like how many people got <laughs> maligned because we said in COVID take vitamin D. It's like, oh no, you can't say that. It's like, oh, get out. You know, so make sure that if you're a male, of course, females too, that you don't have deficiency states and make sure you have plenty of testosterone. Males have dramatically reduced testosterone levels, even like young males, because a pro-inflammatory male is not going to make adequate testosterone. It's a huge problem. I've seen young males. I don't even see very many males in my practice. They're usually someone's relative who gets brought in. And I've seen young males with testosterone levels in the low 200s, and they're yes. like 24 years old. What do you think their immune system is going to work like? But men, for example, in their brains, they during the reproductive years, they they have manu they're manufacturing from their testosterone six to eight times more estradiol. Remember, all the testosterone turns into estradiol when it's converted. But women do fine if they have functioning ovaries because they get plenty of estradiol from their ovaries. But what happens if they don't have functioning ovaries because they're being suppressed through contraceptive methods or through, you know, anorexia or whatever, right? Then their brains are not going to work right. And their, their brains are the control centers too. So men, you have to do all the lifestyle stuff to keep at a low level of inflammation. So that way you do have the, those little tiny quantities of immune cells that you have, they're gonna work optimally, right? Nature doesn't want you men to die. It just, if you have a pandemic, you know, it picks women to survive more, but nobody should die. Everyone should stay healthy. Take your vitamin D, make sure you get all your antioxidants in and don't eat a processed food. I mean, when's the last time you ate a bunch of processed food? I bet then you don't I, eat it. I just don't do it. Yeah. Me either. To me, it's- And haven't for started. decades. Yeah. I never eat that stuff. Why was any, I look in the grocery store and I say, why is anyone buying that poisonous garbage? Real food tastes so much better, you know? Right, but one reason why is for $5, you can get all this stuff. And I oh, wouldn't call it food, I but- Organic dried beans. I make the best bean soup, lentil. This stuff is really inexpensive. Eat your beans, guys. Okay. <laughs> um, can I ask one more question right now? Yes. Um, and in I'm fact, if this is too many slides, you know, we can stop anytime. You know, I don't want to be here forever. No, it's okay. We can go on a little longer. But um, when it, and we, since we're talking about breast cancer risk, and, you know, I mentioned using estriol as, as one of the strategies. Another strategy that is, is utilized is to follow estrogen metabolites. And then if estrogen is going down the wrong pathway, then we can use perhaps nutrients, dim, um, um, you know, uh, calcium deglucurate, et cetera, et cetera. Do you um, follow estrogen metabolites? And if so, what testing do you like to use? So I don't now. I use, okay. and the reason I don't is that they're kind of pricey and I use, I can figure it out. I'm always right. Okay. I look at the person, I look at their other inflammatory markers that are I can have covered. And I pretty much know, you know, like who's doing what. If you have um, a pro-inflammatory, inflamed, obese woman, I can guarantee you her liver is probably fatty liver. She's not detoxifying well. She has the wrong, I have a whole bunch of slides here on the estrabolome, you know, that is so important that to maintain, um, to prevent reproductive diseases of women and cancer. So I just do everything to support. So I give all those antioxidants. I use them. I do everything to support liver detoxification capability. Um, I do everything to support restoration of a healthy gut microbiome. Recognizing, for example, the biggest risk factor for postmenopausal breast cancer is obesity. OK, so we know the risk factors that, you know, so everyone should just just treat them all as if they have bad metabolites. That's the way I approach it. You know, I, you know, like you can tell at a glance, you know, all of us know you can walk down the street and, and we do this in our heads, even if we don't like 
point at them and say, you have diabetes, but you look at someone, you know, they're going to have inflammation, insulin resistance just by their body shape. And, you know, now I, I do body compositions in my office, so I want to know, but I, I'm a pretty, you know, and you can't always judge, you know, what someone's body composition is just by looking at them walking down the street, but you can get a pretty good idea. I bet you, you know, when you're working with your patients and you see like what their arms look like, their muscles or legs, you got a pretty good idea of, you know, what's going on. The, and the skin, by the way, is an excellent, you know, I never understood how the Chinese could do it, you know, stick out your tongue and then, you know, let me look at your hands and all that. I mean, they, they look at signs and things that we don't, we just ignore, but you know, if you start actually using your amazing powers of observation, you will be able to judge a book by its cover in many cases, like look at someone's skin and not just their face. Cause maybe they had like 20 peels and, you know, laser treatments, you know, look at the other skin, you know, when people have a lot of melasma, when people have a lot of aging spots, wrinkles, um, bruising, you know that the outside is the representative of the inside, right? So, you know, be, use all your powers of observation if you feel comfortable and assume the people who look unhealthy and have other unhealthy markers are probably unhealthy inside as far as their detoxification pathways and save them the money so that they can save that money to buy the healthy food at the market and not that garbage process stuff. Do you use Unless all any, your patients are multimillionaires and it doesn't matter. Do you use any particular supplements when you recommend uh, hormone replacement to make sure that they're efficiently metabolizing their uh, estrogen? Well, we have sort of a, a plan. We don't enforce it. Like we don't make people do anything, but we recommend that they do what we call the anti-inflammatory gut reset. That's what we named it. We don't okay. actually use the word detox in my office because in conventional medical circles, that's uh, every, they all roll their eyes. So we don't want people rolling their eyes at us. So we don't, because we don't like say we're detoxing people. What we're doing is supporting detoxification pathways and helping reduce inflammation. And if we use the word detox, you're detoxing off of crap, you know, processed food. It's like people detoxing off of alcohol or, you know, heroin, you know, you got to get rid of all that ridiculous sugar that you're now addicted to, you know, people go through sugar withdrawals, right? So, you know, we, it is kind of like a detox, but, you know, we, we go through, we do a lot of education about endocrine disruptors, how to live in a cleaner environment. We um, talk about time restricted eating. Then we later on, we go into fasting possibilities. So um, basically I start all my patients out doing everything I can to help them to optimize their detoxification pathways. And then we give like the same stuff that I'm sure all of you give, you know, some L-glutamine, we give some coding agents. Sometimes I give butyrate and sometimes I give NAC and, um, you know, derivatives from milk thistle and, you know, selenium, all the usual stuff that, you know, that all the, all the nutraceuticals companies sell different packages for gut support and liver support. And, you know, we use those kinds of things. And, um, and then we try to maintain you know, all the lifestyle, we, you know, we, we really incorporate a lot of lifestyle. So we do um, the heart math for stress, which is so huge in women. Um, like women have a dysregulated autonomic nervous system, um, particularly after menopause, but they're more prone to it anyway. That's why who gets pot syndrome the most, you know, it's females. And so we work with that. We work with sleep. Um, I have, um, you know, we work with body work, you know, for pains and aches and so on. That's why I tried to recruit you here to my office, but, you know, <laughs> you know so, you know, so we, we try, I do, we try to cover it all. So I don't, I hate, I hate, I hate with a passion, like hormone clinics where they just, and this is now getting to be like a fad thing where like plastic surgery offices and cosmetic dermatologists are bringing someone in just to dispense hormones. But I don't believe in that. I believe in looking at the total patient. And just like you're saying, I mean, we got to look at the total health. We got to look at supporting all the systems, just giving hormones and leaving everything else on the table unattended to is not acceptable medicine in my book. So you got to look at the total person. You got to work on all these things, include all of this and not just pass out hormones. That's not good quality medicine. Hormones to me are, you know, like foundational, but they're like building the foundation of a house. Isn't the end, you know, you got to do all the other stuff to make the house beautiful and inhabitable. And that's how I feel about the human body. 
So uh, heal the gut, detox before you put hormones in so you have a healthier body no that way. they're going into. No way, I 100%. And, and we, have a, we have a fitness specialist, happens to be my husband, but that's convenient. But, you know, but, you know, so we do fitness assessments, exercise prescriptions. We have some small, you know, group classes for exercise. We do body composition. So to me, you've got to look at, and you got to deal with every lifestyle issue as much as people will let you, because yes, just giving hormones in an absence of dealing with all these other things and looking at detoxification, even though I don't get the metabolites, we cover it. I just assume I make assumptions that everyone could do better, you know? So that's how I address it. But I don't mind if anyone gets them. I'm just saying, I just assume, you know, that they could use all the stuff I'm giving them. And, and, and when you do recommend hormones, what's your favorite combination of products that you like to use? You know, honestly, I'll give whatever the patient is willing and can afford because, you know, I actually don't have all millionaires in my practice, you know, and we don't price it that way. So, you know, if something's covered by insurance, as long as it's bio human identical, you know, and I can measure levels and I get to physiologic levels, I'm happy, you know, so I will use all the, the gels, the patches that are, you know, commercial products, but I use compounded as a lot too. It's the skin. It's amazing. Like the skin was not evolved for delivery system for hormones. It's, it's supposed to be a barrier. It's supposed to keep things out. And that's why they um, developed like the patch. It's a special matrix dot to try to get the hormones through the skin, but sometimes it doesn't get in. I've had patients where I give every dose of the highest doses of every commercial product and I can't get levels up at all. So then I have to go to compounded and then I have them place it like around the inner labia minora, around the inner, you know, the outer area of the vagina, because that area is very thin. The skin is thinner. It's easier to penetrate and get it absorbed because, you know, that's when you say, okay, put it behind your knees, put it on your inner arm, you know, the thinnest areas of skin you can find to try to get it into the body. That's why measuring levels is so important unless the whole purpose is just symptoms. And, and, and you like to use uh, serum levels for yeah. that. Commit, uh, yeah, right? I don't, but yeah, isn't, I don't, there an, isn't there an issue with um, when you use topical estrogen that maybe serum's not the best way to measure it? No, it's the best we've got. And we have the most data on that. And, you know, I, I'm waiting for the day that there's some support for saliva. By the way, urinary is pretty good too. It's just not very practical. Okay. But the saliva really has not held up. I know there are people out there who just adore. Why, why is urine not practical? Well, you know, it's, it's expensive. It's not covered by any insurances and, you know, so you have to send it out to specialty labs, but, you know, but um, I do menstrual mapping with the urine. Okay. When, when it's appropriate, you know, right. it's, it's, I'm very, I am really truly cost conscious because, you know, you can see all the things we ask our patients to do, right. Fitness and detox, you know, what we call it reset and buying these different supplements. And I tell them, please buy the best organic foods and things. And so, so I realize I can't like bankrupt every patient, you know, that yeah, I, I guess as a chiropractor, I don't ever expect any testing to be covered and we don't even try to put it. Oh, uh, well, since I can, you know, order tests that are covered by insurance as much as I can, I, I try to get things covered by insurance, but, you know, but if people like, if money is no object, then I will, you know, do other things, but, you know. Yeah. You can, you, you, you can get a female Dutch panel for 150 bucks. Um, well, the Dutch panel is fine, but not if you're on hormones. I don't actually think it's, it's the, as useful if you're as a, for someone who's on hormones, but if they're not on hormones, it's fine. But, you know, I can get, you know, serum levels in someone who's not on hormones and it's usually close to zero or zero. So, but I'm totally fine with whatever people are willing to get or get, you know, I just believe very strongly in monitoring. I don't think that you right. should, I, I really believe that you got to measure and monitor and follow if, unless your goal is nothing but suppressing night sweats and hot flashes, that's in that case, then you don't have to measure anything. You just, give the lowest dose. And when they say they feel better, you stop. But you know, that that's not what I do. I'm, I'm going for healthy longevity. I'm not going for right. just 
expression of the symptoms. But, you know, that's what the conventional world is doing, though. You know, we're, we're exceptions to the rule. We are right. by looking at healthy longevity using hormones, because most the still even doesn't matter what the data shows The the current mantra is use the smallest dose for the shortest time. It hasn't changed. You know, that's why I'm out there, you know, trying to get it into people's heads, <laughs> you know, that if you want to have a long, healthy life, you need to have hormones. It's like foundational. That's why I say you want to have metabolic health. You have to have hormones. You want to have immune function. You got to have hormones. You don't want to be st a status chronic inflammation, then get those hormones, but it's necessary, but not sufficient. You know, you still need the nutrients. What's the point if you are like deficient in half the antioxidants in your body, you know, and you have no healthy gut microbiome, just throwing hormones into someone. That's why I don't like hormone clinics where they just throw hormones at people. You know, I think we're all on the same page because everyone who's here, everyone who listens, we're exceptions to the rule. That's, you know, we formed our own little club and we're living in our own little cocoon because we know that this is the right thing to do. But that's why I keep trying to break into that other gigantic cocoon, <laughs> which is everybody else out there in the medical world. So that, you know, it's not just us convincing us, you know, but, you know, but we so learn each other. Lindell asked a question about uh, studies to back up what you're talking about, but um, every one of your slides is supported by references that you have on the slides. I'm very evidence-based and I show evidence-based um, research in my office to my patients. I want them to know that there's like, you can't be more evidence-based than me. I research everything. I'm like a PubMed Google Scholar uh, addict, you know? So that's, I mean, I'm what I, I labeled myself a synthesizer. I'm not a researcher, I'm a clinician. And I have never published a single independent, you know, research paper. I, I wish I had, but that's not who I decided to become. I was offered to be an MD PhD at NYU and I walked away from it. I just wanted to be a clinician. I didn't want to be a researcher. And so I'm a synthesizer. I look at everyone else's research, everyone else's published peer reviewed reports, and I put it together to create a clinical message. Because what I hate is science that's never applied clinically. You know, that is crazy. You have all these amazing researchers, they figure all this stuff out and then it just languishes and doesn't get applied in any clinical fashion to actually help people. So um, unless a pharmaceutical company takes it over and that's not what we want, you know? So that's why my job is to research everything and put it together in some kind of cohesive whole and then apply it clinically. Okay. Maybe, and maybe. So, yes, I can support everything I say. I'm sure you can. And, but sometimes um, I tell you it's a rat study, you know, and I, sorry, there's no human study. And I say, like I tell my patients all the time, this is my best guess. There's no data. You know, I, I'm always like honest when there's no data, there's no data. And I thought, well, what I can do is just like um, make these slides available to people. And because at the end, I have my usual, which is, okay, what are you going to do? Well, you already know about hormones, but then you incorporate all the lifestyle stuff, you know, which I'm sure you're all as expert as I am in it. I just emphasize over and over, feed your gut and nurture your gut microbiome. And uh, that's really important for overall health of every organ system. You know, the, now, the more we learn about these microbiomes, the more we know they're precious material, you know, precious cargo on board. You know, we don't want to torture them, kill them or starve them. That's not useful. So um, so basically, um, you know, I talk about how um, these hormones protect the brain from neuroinflammation, how um, the gut transmits um, signals to maintain you know, the like here. It shows that you have the um fermentation of the fibers, and then you have the um, short chain fatty acids and, you know, all of this information, there's immune cells that line the gut, the gut associated lymphoid tissue, and it communicates between the different cells, the immune cells that line the gut. And then you have the pyrus patches, which have the, the lymphocytes and how all of this interacts to maintain proper function and hormones have a huge impact on the gut microbiome. The gut microbiome is so important with estrogen that there's a specific group of, 
of microbes called the estrobilome that are essential for the um, metabolism of estrogen. And uh, this is so important to maintain. And we've talked about pregnancy a lot. And By so the way, are there certain gut bacteria that you can point to that are important for the estrobilome? No, it's like it's like there's trillions of bacteria. So we're just breaking into it. But I use I, I tell people eat fermented foods. I'm a big fan of kimchi. So I have um, my middle daughter married someone who's half Korean. So we're big on kimchi. And my my little um, granddaughter, her favorite food is uh, kimchi soup. So, you know, that's great. And um, I grew up with sauerkraut. Fortunately, I actually like this stuff, but it's really essential. And but, you know, so I use a variety of probiotics. I think don't use the same one over and over. We we don't want to push towards one species. You know, we want to have diversity. If, if there's one thing we know, it's diversity of the gut microbiome is what really brings optimal health. And in this slide, I really love this slide because it shows when you have gut dysbiosis, you have estrobilum dysfunction. Look at all the things. It's all interlinked. Increase of endometriosis, PCOS, obesity, metabolic syndrome, cancer, and brain health goes down the tubes. This is all, that's why focus on the gut, focus on the gut. All of this stuff is interrelated. That's why all of my women patients have to have gut restoration treatments, right? And, you know, this is like when you don't have the right gut microbiome, you end up with autoimmune diseases and all these problems. And the circadian rhythm is regulated when you eat matters as much as what you eat. So you have synchronization and you have metabolic health. And circadian rhythm is modulated by estrogen. Women who work night shifts have high rates of cancer, metabolic dysfunction, um, increased risk of dementia and mood problems. And I showed this, this SEN stands for suprachiasmatic nucleus, the master clock. And here you see in the brain, this is a hypothalamus, ER, ER, that stands for estrogen receptor. And see, it shows beta and alpha. That's why you don't want just one. You don't want just anyone. You want them all. See how they work together to, and they, they have, see these peptides, everybody loves peptides. Well, you make them naturally when you give, you know, the right stuff. And see, VIP comes from the suprachiasmatic nucleus to the area, the neurons in the hypothalamus that then put out the little triggers that go to the pituitary to make the gonadotropins. The KISS peptins are peptides that feed, that, you know, recognize um, nutrient status, which is all regulated by estradiol. Without estradiol, you're going to have massive problems in appetite regulation and circadian rhythm, and that translates into reproductive problems, but also metabolic problems. It's all interrelated. So this is about shift work. The immune system is incredibly circadian. When you have disruption, look what you get. Low-grade inflammation. You have compromised adaptive immunity, autoimmunity, allergic responses, decreased tumor surveillance. That's why it's so important to get to sleep, to eat at the right times and to have hormones because it regulates. Um, so this is where I just go over my, my recommendations, eat lots of healthy plants, eat at the right times, make sure you get some sleep, work on stress, sometimes do fasting, get exercise. And I have this whole section, which I'm not going to do because um, I love talking about more stuff, but I think I talked out, but um, HPV is, is an estrogen modulated virus. And this is not well understood. Um, so, for example, um, estrogen is very important for and metabolites of estrogen. That's why DIM is often given to women who have HPV, chronic HPV. And this is important because oral contraceptives increase cervical cancer risk dramatically, dramatically. After 10 years of use, I have patients on 30 years of birth control pills. It increases the risk of cervical cancer 400%, four times. And so we're giving all these women the vaccine for HPV. And at the same time that we're giving them birth control pills, which dramatically increases the risk of cervical cancer. Why is this not talked about? The World Health Organization, WHO, this is back from 2002, published in the British Medical Journal, links long-term pill use to cervical cancer. This is not debatable. I put down from, the, I just copied a bunch of stuff from the, the article because this is huge. And women who have babies, five full-term pregnancies and took the pill for more than five years have increased risk of cervical cancer 12-fold. 
come on guys why is people people not and then what what do you do nutritionally well a lot of them have high homocysteine you want to deal with that so Disney, who knew like high homocysteine increases cervical neoplasia. So we want to do all the things that we do, all the antioxidants. You folate is always so important for protecting DNA, the fruits and the vegetables. So you have patients who have chronic HPV. This is what I'm telling you to do to help them um, that they need to um, recognize the birth control pill is increasing the risk of cervical cancer. Get off of it and do something else for prevention of unwanted pregnancies and get all of these polyphenols and antioxidants from plants and such into the body and soy isoflavones, eating organic whole soy and having green tea is very good for prevention of cervical cancer. And there's studies to show that. And when you eat the wrong diet, guess what? It changes the vaginal microbiome. They've linked vaginal microbiomes to the Western diet. How is that? And then you have patients that come in with vaginitis. Think about what they're eating. Who's thinking about that, right? Think about that. So when you have the wrong vaginal microbiome, you increase your risk dramatically of getting cervical cancer. And they've shown the different, like, um, you know, you asked me about specific types of bacteria. We actually have that for the vagina. So you can look at this. So the takeaway message, hormones matter. Females are better than men when it comes to immune function, but men are super great. We love them, okay? Just don't um, don't get sick, please, because you're less likely to survive. But if you eat all the right foods and you do everything, you will survive, okay? And maintain that testosterone and don't have a lot of inflammation that lowers your testosterone. And in fact, inflammation lowers estrogen production. I deal with that with PCOS women. They have inflamed ovaries. Inflamed ovaries will cause earlier menopause. We do not want that. We need our ovaries to last as long as possible. So women are powerful with their immune systems. They're more likely to get autoimmune diseases. When things go wrong, they go wrong bigger in those you know women who have smaller muscles, but great immune systems and lots of immune cells. So you want to do it all. Get sunlight, get love, exercise, eat, sometimes don't eat, eat the right foods, keep your pathways going, work on your circadian rhythm, and you will live a happy life and so will your patients. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gersh. Awesome presentation. Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way more people will be able to find this Rational Wellness Podcast when they're searching for health podcasts. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do now have a few openings for new nutritional consultations for patients um, at my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Clinic. So if you're interested, please call my office, 310-395-3111 and sign up for one of the few remaining slots for a comprehensive nutritional consultation with Dr. Ben White. Thank you and see you next week.